Well, hello everybody. Hope you're all having a great time. Wherever you are around the world. Today I thought I'd read to you about when Enoch, in the book of Enoch, when he got translated, this means taken up to heaven. This is taken from chapter 71 of my book, Enoch Insights. And it came to pass, and it ascended into the heavens, and I saw the holy sons of God, talk about the angels of God, and they were stepping on flames of fire, and their garments were white, and their faces shone like snow. And I saw two streams of fire, and the light of that fire shone like hyacinth, and I fell on my face before the Lord of Spirits. Hebrews 11.5 By faith Enoch was translated to not see death, was not found, because God had translated him. Before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Of course, if you want to know a lot about Enoch and his life, you need to read the book of Jasher, which spends several chapters talking about Enoch. Jasher 3.36 and it was upon the seventh day that Enoch ascended into heaven in a whirlwind with horses and chariots of fire. Jubilees 4.23 And he, Enoch, was taken from amongst the children of men, and we, the angels of God, conducted him, him into the Garden of Eden in majesty and honour. Verse 2 And the angel Michael, one of the archangels, seized me by my right hand and lifted me up and led me forth into all the secrets and he showed me all the secrets of righteousness and he showed me all the secrets of the ends of the heaven and all the chambers of the stars and all the luminaries whence they proceed before the face of the holy ones and he translated my spirit into the heaven of heavens and i saw there as it were a structure built of crystals and between those crystals, tongues of living fire. And my spirit saw the girdle which girt that house of fire, and on its four sides were streams of live fire, and they girt that house. And round about were seraphim, cherubim, ophanim. And these are they who sleep not, and guard the throne of his glory. And I saw the angels who could not be counted, a thousand thousand, ten thousand times ten thousand, encircling the house. And Michael, that's the archangel Michael, and archangel Raphael, and Gabriel, and Phanuel, all archangels, and the holy angels who are above the heavens, go in and out of that house. Who are the seraphim, cherubim, ophanim? The key to understanding the seraphim is in Isaiah's description. The seraphim stood above him, Isaiah 6, 2. The seraphim are the two living creatures covering the throne of God from above, while the cherubim, or the four beasts, are the four living creatures covering the throne from beneath and on the sides. The seraphim are two in number and were seen in Isaiah as above the throne of God. The cherubim are four in number, as seen in Revelation chapter 4, and are always around the throne of God. In Ezekiel chapters 1 and 10, the Ophanim is another name for living wheels, or a wheel within a wheel. These three types of beings are seen together and concern the throne of God. And that's quite a study in itself, which you can read more details of in the appendix of this book. Verse 5. And it came forth from that house, and Michael and Gabriel and Raphael and Phanuel and many holy angels without number and with them the head of days, his head white and pure as wool and his raiment indescribable. And I fell upon my face and my holy body became relaxed, my spirit was transfigured and I cried with a loud voice with a spirit of power and blessed and glorified and extolled. And these blessings which went forth out of my mouth well-pleasing before the head of days. 
Comment number three. Jesus Christ was also transfigured, what is noteworthy, as it happened quite some time before his actual physical death. He was met by Moses and Elias, or Elijah, on a mountain where he was transfigured. I think it happened about a week before his crucifixion. Where they talked to Jesus of his coming death, Matthew 17, 2, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. Mark 9, 2. And after six days, Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John, and leads them up into a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. Mark 9, 3. And his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can white them. Mark 9, 4. And there appeared unto him Elias with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Comment 4. Note how the Enoch was transfigured, as was also Moses. Only a few people throughout Bible times were actually transfigured like Christ. Verse 7. And the head of days came with Michael and Gabriel, Raphael and Phanuel, thousands of ten thousands of angels without number. Lost passage wherein the Son of Man was described as accompanying the head of days. And Enoch asked one of the angels, as in Enoch chapter 46, concerned the Son of Man as to who he was. Also Daniel talked about in Daniel chapter 7 about Jesus. Daniel 7, 13. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days and had brought him near before him. And he, the angel, came to me and greeted me with his voice and said unto me, This, the Son of Man, capitals, was who is born unto righteousness, and righteousness abides over him, and the righteousness of the head of days forsakes him not. And he said unto me, He proclaims unto thee, Peace in the name of the world to come. For from hence has proceeded peace since the creation of the world. So shall it be unto thee for ever and ever. And all shall walk in his ways, since righteousness never forsakes him. With him will be their dwelling places, and with him their heritage. And they shall not be separated from him for ever and ever and ever. And that's right, we're not going to be separated from Jesus. John 14, 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. That's Jesus talking. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you. John 14, 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Verse 10. And so there should be a length of days with the Son of Man, that's Jesus, and a righteous shall have peace and an upright way in the name of the Lord of Spirits for ever and ever. That's just beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. We're going to be with Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit forever. And we're going to a world where there's no war, no destruction, no pain, no sorrow, and where everything you do is beautiful, where everything you do bears good fruit, and where you have perfect communication with other people, perfect understanding, unlike this world. As one little girl said one time, well, I've always seen heaven as a place where everything works out perfectly. It's just better than this life. It's like all the beautiful things, minus the negative. Well, she's right. That is a good way of putting it. Okay, so I'm going back one chapter, because this seems to talk about the same thing. Chapter 70. And it came to pass after this that his name during his lifetime was raised aloft to that Son of Man and to the Lord of Spirits, from amongst those who dwell on the earth. And he was raised aloft on the chariots of the Spirit, and his name vanished among them. Comment 1. 
This sounds like the first coming of Christ and his subsequent ascension up to heaven. His name vanished among them. Could this possibly mean that after Jesus' death, a Jewish nation minimized the name of Jesus? In fact, in modern times, the name of Jesus become a curse word instead of a word of blessing and honor and majesty and might. Sadly, the Pharisees' rejection of Jesus as Messiah has indeed led millions of people astray from the truth and damned countless souls to hell. Mark 16:19. So then, after the Lord has spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. John 14, 6. And Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Acts 4, 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. From that day I was no longer numbered amongst them, and he set me between the two winds, between the north and the west, where the angels took cords to measure for me the place for the elect and righteous. And there I saw the first fathers and the righteous, who from the beginning dwell in that place. Here's more mentioned about Enoch. This is chapter 12 from my book, Enoch Insights. Before these things, Enoch was hidden, and no one of the children of men knew where he was hidden, where he abode, or what had become of him. And his activities had to do with the watchers, and his days were with the holy ones. Comment number one. This verse here is not saying necessarily that Enoch is being translated, at least perhaps not quite yet, but that he is hidden from men while he devotes his time to spending it with the holy watchers in heaven. Yeah, you've got the good watchers up in heaven, you've got the bad watchers or fallen angels who had come down here. Book of Jasher. And it was in the year of Adam's death, 930 AC, or after creation, which was the 243rd year of the reign of Enoch. In that time, Enoch resolved to separate himself from the sons of men and to secrete himself as at the first in order to serve the Lord. Yes, you should read about Enoch in the book of Joshua. It's very informative that he was a sort of king of kings for over 243 years. He reigned over about 120 kings, so listen to him. Comment 2. There is a verse in the book of Enoch about Enoch's translation. Enoch 39.3 And those days a whirlwind carried me up from the earth and set me down at the ends of the heavens. And I, Enoch, was blessing the Lord of Majesty and the King of Ages, and lo, the watchers called me. These are the good watchers. Because Enoch also talked with the bad watchers face to face, told them off. Amazing. The watchers called me, Enoch, scribe of righteousness. Go declare unto the watchers of heaven. Now he's talking, go and talk to the bad watchers, the fallen angels, who have left the high heaven and holy eternal place and defile themselves with women and have done as the children of earth do, and have taken unto themselves wives, ye have wrought great destruction on the earth, and ye shall have no peace for forgiveness of sin, insomuch as they delight themselves in their children, and the murder of their beloved ones shall they see, and over the destruction of their children shall they lament, and shall make supplication unto eternity. But mercy and peace shall ye not attain." That's very interesting. That message was given to Enoch by the watchers or angels in heaven to go and tell the fallen angels that they're not going to be forgiven. Really, really amazing. That's what it leads on to the next chapter here, chapter 13. In my book, Enoch, in sites, chapter 13 of the book Enoch. And Enoch went... And said to Azazel, he was the leader of the fallen angels, A severe sentence has gone forth against thee to put thee into bonds and grant it to thee, because of the unrighteousness which thou hast taught, and because of all the one which thou hast shown to men. Comment 1. No forgiveness, because they had already rejected Jesus, God's only begotten Son, before the creation of the earth, while still in heaven or in pre Adamic times. Verse 2. Then I went and spoke to all of them together. Talking about the fallen angels, the first 200 fallen angels. And they were all afraid, and fear and trembling seized them. And he besought me to draw up a petition for them. They might find forgiveness, 
and to read their petition in the presence of the Lord of heaven. For from henceforth they could not speak to him, nor lift up their eyes to heaven for shame of their sins for which they had been condemned. Comment 2. Here it is evident that the fallen angels had lost some of their former powers and abilities. They could not speak with him, with God, nor lift up their eyes to heaven for shame of their sins for which they had been condemned. Comment 3. The most dangerous thing that any of us on earth can do is to repeatedly resist God's Holy Spirit. Proverbs 29.1 Yeah, Jesus said so too. Any sin you do against me, the Son of God, can be forgiven. But he that sinneth against the Holy Ghost will not be forgiven in this life or the life to come. So the fallen angels went too far and they weren't forgiven because he insulted the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And I told you, the Holy Spirit's female. As I said before, a man might take quite a bit from others, but you hurt his wife, he's not going to take it. You're going to be in big trouble to harm his wife. And God's the same way with the Holy Spirit. Jesus said that too. Then I wrote out their petition and a prayer in regard to their spirits and their deeds individually and in regard to their requests. They should have forgiveness and length of days and I went off and sat down at the waters of Dan, in the land of Dan, to the south of the west of Hermon. I read their petition, fell asleep. Land of Dan, near Mount Hermon. Well, that's where the four angels first came down. And behold, a dream came to me, and the visions fell down upon me. I saw visions of chastisement, and a voice came bidding me to tell it to the sons of heaven and reprimand them. And when I awoke, I came unto them, and all sitting gathered together, weeping in Abishael, which is between Lebanon and Senazer, and their faces covered. And I recounted before them all the visions which I had seen in sleep, and I began to speak the words of righteousness, and to reprimand the heavenly watchers. Comment 5. Enoch was given unusual powers from God to actually reprimand the fallen angels right to their faces. No one in history has repeated that. Well, I hope you found that interesting. Do get hold of my insights book. This one's Enoch Insights. It's full of treasures. The book of Enoch itself is full of treasures. All I've done is to add comments and to put appropriate Bible verses in here to connect it together. Because I'm of the great conviction that it was a very big mistake taking the Apocrypha books out of the King James Bible way back in 1885 and I convinced that was a big trick of Satan himself to get people away from the exciting truth of the Word of God. I think you need both. I think you need your Bibles and the Apocrypha books. And the Apocrypha books will deepen your faith and show you the amazing miracles that God has done. Incredible things. Absolutely amazing things. And that's why the pocket books are very important to know. So please do get my seven insights books, starting with Enoch Insights, then Esdras Insights. That one I'm making a new, new edition for. It's going to be three times the size. It'll come out shortly with a new cover, a totally new book, really. It's been beefed up strongly. I'm sort of working on it as I speak. That's Esdras Insights, but it'll have the pocket books of Esdras Book 1, Book 2, and all 1,000 years of Bible history from creation to Christ, which I think we will find very useful. A book for teaching others. That's the intention. But that will come out shortly. That's That will be Esther's Insights, the new version, which is really a totally new book. Maybe in a couple of months' time that one should come out. We do get my other books, which is Enoch Insights, Esther's Insights, the first edition. Then you've got Joshua Insights, book one and two. And the first book talks a lot about Enoch and how he lived and his influence. Then you've got Jubilee's Insights, that also talks about Enoch. And then you've got Eden Insights, about Adam and Eve. That's very beautiful in the early days on the earth. And then you've got the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs Insights. That came out six months ago 
And then you've got my other two paranormal books out of the bottomless pit, books one and two, which also connect with the apocryphal books and the Bible. So thanks for listening. I hope you found that useful. I'll see you again soon. Bye for now.